seated. Our scriptures begins with the second year and the seventh month and the 21st day. Because when you've lost someone, you know. You know the year and you know the month and you know the day. Grief work is some of the hardest work that we are called to do. And it is a layering that continues with us for a while. A while that we would rather be a whole heck of a lot shorter, that's speaking for me, um, than for what I have encountered it and seen others encounter it to be. We enter into this story with a people who have watched their city die, who have watched her being taken over by an invading force, who have watched her be broken and spent and torn apart. They've been scattered in exile, and as hard as it was to watch Jerusalem die, it was harder still to live. Because their whole point and their whole meaning was destroyed. And they were scattered. And it was a strange land. And it was a strange feeling where no one, nothing and no one felt real around them. But as painful as the exile was, as painful as being away from everyone was, there was also a gift of distance. They didn't have to see her broken anymore or feel that pain. And there was a greater enemy they could rage against in the rawest part of their grief. But we enter the story this time with them returning home. Because Persians have conquered the Babylonians, and now they get to go back to Jerusalem they're really excited to be able to go home and to be together and to have that again. But nothing's the way it was that they remembered. And when they go back home, the temple is still destroyed. And they have to see it again face to face. And it's at this point that we step into their story and their pain because, you see, they're there, they're back. But now, instead of it being so many years since the destruction, about 75 to be exact, it's like it was yesterday. And all of the pain and the smells and the tears and the fear come in waves back to their shores. And they can't do it. And so for everything that they've built up and all the excitement of being home again and rebuilding the temple together and bringing back what was lost and what was destroyed, they can't. And so they turn away and they build their own houses and they each attend to what they have to do because coming together to do the work of cleaning out the closets or putting the estate up, of sorting through everyone and everything is too much. It hurts. And it's at this point of the story that God calls to Haggai. Haggai responds and serves as a prophet of the Lord for three months, just three months in which God brings a word through Haggai to help the Israelites in their grieving. Because it's good and it's right to remember the Camelot moments of our lives, of those times with our families, of those times here at Epworth, when everything was beautiful and right and there was an energy and a sense of possibility of things lining up as the right place at the right time for the right reasons and all that was accomplished and all that happened. And in exile, the Israelites had time to look back at that time and build a lot more into it than was ever there. And now they're back, 
And now they see the broken ruins. And there's a hopelessness that sets in that begins to sap away the joy and the expectation and the excitement of building again. And so God calls to Haggai because as good as it is to remember those Camelot moments, we can't get stuck there. Because we have been given a great gift in those moments of tasting what God can do and what God can bring about together and what happens in those times of all of God's justice and joy and wholeness and peace and rightness. But when those moments go, and they will, because heaven doesn't reign on earth yet, and there will always be something, whether it's Babylonians or cancer or horrific accidents. But it is our choice as to whether or not we move through those moments, or better yet, we let God move through us to the point where we can begin to build again with God, that we can turn towards the ruins, and instead of being trapped in hopelessness, Hear the call of God through the prophet Haggai. Who here, who was here to remember the former glory? Who remembers those Camelot moments? Who remembers the power of them and what happened with them? And what does now look like to you? And in Haggai's words, doesn't it look as nothing? What are we going to give to the next generation? Are we going to give ruins and hopelessness and if onlys? Or are we going to give the building work that will create a new Camelot? A new moment where they can know the power that we have known and where God's work can continue. And the best thing about this is The words of Haggai that say, take courage. God is a parent who has violently lost God's son. God knows how hard it is. God knows what ruins look like and I would say even feel like. But God also knows what new beginnings and new days and new building looks like and feels like. And so God promises us through Haggai to take courage because God will be with us and God's spirit will abide with us. And what's more, God will shake the heavens and the earth. God will shake the heavens and the earth to bring back what was stolen, to bring back what we were robbed of. When God says later in those verses, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, God means to remind the Israelites of all that they're lamenting and losing, right? Because of all the gold and silver that the Babylonians took from the temple, the valuables that they stole and then possessed as their own. God will shake the heavens and the earth and bring that gold and that silver, bring what was stolen back. And so we know the end game. We know the power of God to establish justice and joy where we have been robbed of it. We know the power of God to go through the very worst of violence and of death and of fear to give us life again. To promise us a day when Christ will return and when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. When mourning and crying will be no more for God will swallow up the shroud of death that covers us. And God's heaven, God's will will reign on earth and all will be one. That is the hope that we know. 
That is the hope that Haggai calls to the people to remind us so that when we look at the ruins of the temple or the bodies that are broken, we don't end in hopelessness and despair. We end in a deep breath of assurance and commitment that is able to see beyond and that is able to see new. And this is harder work than anything we will ever be called to do. But it is also the work that will bring greater life and greater glory than anything we can imagine or expect. And so on this All Saints Sunday, in a moment, we will light the candles. And many of these candles will represent lights that were taken way too soon and way too violently and way too painfully. But they will also signify a hope of what God can build and what God does build through the legacies that have been given to us and through God's own spirit abiding with us. Because we know that these lights still shine. And we know that our lights shine with them. That's the beauty of being a part of the community of saints together. And we know that God's glory will be revealed in all of this. And so Haggai offers us a challenge today as well. How does it look to us now? Our own families and Epworth have our Camelot moments of history that we want to go back to and reclaim when everything was alive and the way we wanted it to be. Life happens in the in-between. But the question to us is whether or not we will answer God's call to build again. This is the question of stewardship. The first chapter of Haggai, a little bit before the verses we read, Haggai's first address to the people says, You have looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins while you busy yourselves each with his own house. God is asking us to rebuild God's house. Literally, in that case, with the temple, but figuratively in terms of the living house, the community of saints, the church. And so the question of stewardship is one of where do we put our resources and where do we trust God? Do we turn each to his own house because of hopelessness? Because we can never make a difference anyway, so we're just going to take care of the little we can and give up on everything else? Or do we let God turn our grief and turn our pain and turn our hopelessness back to building something more, a house, a people in which other people in grief can know a hope and a promise of God's glory, of God's work, of God's love that can transform the most impossible of situations to bring about possibilities, new Camelot moments, that are even more prosperous and more beautiful than the last, that we can't even imagine that because the last were so good. But God has more. And so we come together on this day to remember that legacy and to pledge ourselves to join our lights with their lights so that the legacy God has given us through them does not end with us, but is a legacy that continues on to the next and to the next and to the next generations in greater and greater glory, so that what begins as a foretaste of God's kingdom of justice and joy 
will one day be completed as God reigns with us, where heaven and earth are one and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. I would ask for a moment of silence. And Emma and Michaela and Noah, if you would come forward. Um, there are the two candlesticks on the front pew there. And we're going to share these lights. And we're going to honor what those who have gone before us have built and pledge to join them in the building work. All right, go ahead and light the candles, and I'm going to start sharing the names. Got it, guys? Oh, seriously? You know, you have to preach about things going wrong, and then you get Exhibit A. Okay, is this one too? Okay, we are in trouble. All right, um, how are we going to do this? Um, Dottie, there are regular candles in there, right? Long, longer ones? Can we get those? And then with those, the biggest thing, guys, is you're going to need to tip the um, lights that we're lighting to bring it to the light, okay? All right. And we're going to get this. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, we'll light them from those candles. Okay. All right, Noah and Emma, you want to take those? Okay. And so you're going to keep, because we don't have the um, covers for them, so there's going to be a little bit of hot wax dripping. So try to keep this as upright as you can. Okay? All right. Can you reach these? Okay. You guys comfortable with this? Okay, so for Ruth Archibald, keep ringing. For George Bonney, for Joseph Bose, for Catherine E.W. Bosley, for Elton Bosley, for Ronald Ryan Bosley, for Marla Brady, for Dan Boyer Jr., for Dorothea Close, Fred Davis, and Dorothea Fedick, and Jeanette Griffin. For Libby Hamilton, and Kathy Hiddle. Claudia Jones, and Walter King. For Carolyn Lambert, and Lauren M. Lorenz. For Julia Loveride, and Gordon M. For Nikki Mansfield and Glenn Mina. For Margaret Muller and Randy Moore. For Kenneth Moorhead and Roger Moorhead. For Phil Morey and Arlene Neumeyer. For Joanne Peterson and Claude Phelps. For Yolan Price and Chelsea Rodifer. For Taft Phoebus and Jack Santangelo. For Ryan Michael Schupert. For Dorothy Smith and Betty Sparks. And Barbara Streeter and George Streeter and Lee Streeter and John Spara and Rose Spara and John O'Bara and Wally Werner and Costello Woods. 
And as Michaela continues to ring the bell, would you share any other names that you would like to name? Thank you all. And I can't hear you. Go ahead. Oh, you got yours? 